can transpose this scene into esports and have like Nicola and I on six years ago. <laughs> I'm the owner of Astralis. Wait, heroic. Astralis, heroic. You know, like, there's so many it's things. funny. The mechanism, exactly. It's just good. <laughs> We're back with more foreplay this week. It's film noir once again as we take a mighty leap forward to 1974's Chinatown. Uh, we're skipping like 15 to 20 years every time. Actually, we're going to skip more than 20 years uh, in the next mm -hmm. one. We go to L.A. Confidential in 1997. Uh, but we are getting our overview of the film noir genre. And as we had spoken about previously, the Hayes Code was... The the you can go back to our episode about the Maltese Falcon, basically the prohibitions on subject matter, such as certain amounts of sex and violence, drugs, um, uh, cheating on your spouse, you know, infidelity, all of these things, interracial mingling uh, that they had banned in Hollywood. And yeah. so what's interesting as we come into this era is both of these films are going to be set in the late 30s slash, you know, early 40s even though they were created much later. But this is what film noir, in terms of substance, storyline substance, should have been. It's what the novels were at the time. There were They were full of drugs and violence and corrupt police and prostitutes, and they couldn't show a lot of these things on screen. So now we're getting film noir as it should have been in like the 30s and 40s era set in that timeline, so not in the 50s like, uh, like Touch of Evil. Yeah, this is probably the most, I mean, out of all of them, even including LA Confidential, I think this is the most kind of adult and sinister themed film noir. I thought it was kind of interesting because I did a bunch of reading about this. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, I think many people's, I think uh, it's often voted in the top 20 movies of all time i think it might even be putting that little time capsule of american cinema it's just an all-around great film but you know what what when i was like reading about it is it like really touches into for the 70s particularly some pretty shocking stuff uh, as we'll get to there's incest in there even if we want to ignore that and uh, and sort of what it relates to in terms of the broader story this idea of special interests and corporations taking something as precious as water and commodifying it and using it as a vector to do all this sinister stuff uh it's actually such a fantastically dark film and i haven't seen this in a long time i for me, Chinatown is a film you always think you remember until you sit down and watch it. And then you go, oh, fuck. Oh, my God. This is actually so bleak. Uh, and I literally just watched it last night before recording this. And I was like, oh, my God. Uh, I'd totally forgotten just how dark it is. But, yeah, this is noir for adults. This is noir talking about the battle for the soul it's really fucking great <laughs> i can't <laughs> wait to talk about it. it it is the most grim too uh this is yeah. like the pinnacle of the good guys lose everything was absolutely oh, yeah. pointless corruption and power win the day uh there is no hope uh and not only is it going to enrich people unjustly but also the implication is lead to more, you know, fucked up sex crimes and incest at the end of the day. So it is uniquely, uniquely grim. Yes. I actually think low key, bearing in mind, it's funny because there is actually some quite heinous violence in the ending, but people are going to think from the way we're vaguely describing it now that like it must be like some modern day, you know, movie where like 50 people get tortured or something. It's not like that. It's not the spectacle aspect that makes wow. the ending dark. It's actually the psychological like implications of the ending that actually low key is one of the most horrifying endings to a movie ever. Because as we're talking about, since you have the genius of this movie is it's an, simultaneously an homage to noir, but then it subverts even 
even a basic concept is that you at least get something out of it. Like normally at the end, it's like either he has to survive or he saves the woman or maybe you foil one of the enemies. You do some. They actually accomplish nothing at the end of this film. At the end of this film, the bad guys not only completely win, they like win in a way that shows that you, like normal people would never have power over them. The John Houston character, basically. And even worse than that, it's even implied. I don't think people actually know how dark this ending is. If you followed the quite dense and like drawn out plot about the Faye Dunaway character, who was the, the the mother of the daughter at the end who gets taken by John Houston, it's almost implied he's now going to fuck his granddaughter yes. slash daughter as well and start the same cycle over again, which the one was trying to escape. I don't think people realize how insanely dark that is. And in fact, yeah. the ending they I'm give the you complicit with that. <laughs> one moment of essentially the one breath of air you get at the end is sort of like, and we would also have just shot you now, but whatever, I guess you can live, which is like, what? it's the end of the film. <laughs> Fuck, you know, like, no, that same thing, Richard, like, in my mind, I knew, like, the iconic line, and I knew the, what, I remember famously, like, how gnarly it looks when the woman's shot in the eye with the bullet and stuff, and the woman getting, yep. but I didn't actually remember, like, that implication, but, like, the psychological part's way more terrifying to me, like, it's actually really low-key, a very dark ending of a movie, and what's great is the way the film's done, because I will give Polanski this, he is a very good, stylish movie director, like, he's great at his shots and set up the movie, right, I tell you what, he does actually make it, so if you don't know this film, you're going to assume because of how drawn out it is and how long the build-up is there's going to be a big payoff like at the end some like it, essentially at the end what you think is and they do this really well you think that like it's going to be like the classic thing where it's like they don't believe you but you get like the right piece of info you say the right thing to the other cop and they're like right okay then and then when you sort of realize like actually no you're just like the main character you're just all gonna the story dies with you it's that's a really horrible ending to a film yeah yeah and I, I think, uh, you know, not to jump right to the ending, but we should give a brief summary. And uh, as we've talked about previously in film noir, a lot of these movies are basically first person perspectives of the main character, because part of the art of it and part of the journey that the audience takes is getting all the same information that the main character has and then trying to put together the pieces. Right. Because that's where all mm. of the lies within lies become interesting uh, and th this movie is about as close as any movie could possibly get to a first person experience through uh, Jack Nicholson's character, uh, Jake Giddis, right? Um, because mm. he's in absolutely every scene. You only know and see what he knows and sees. And what's funny about this film is I was thinking about trying to describe the plot and it's very difficult to make this sound interesting because the subject matter is yeah. so... <clears throat> kind of boring. I was going to say dry. Yeah. That would be a little pun, too punny on the, no, the water. I, it's, <laughs> I, I, I almost preempted it. No, the, the, the problem with the plot is, uh, as you say, it's about something that's not very uh, slice of life at all. And, and and I think that's deliberate. I think that is baked into yes. the film. I mean, so so... Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so part of this is like it it is the subject matter is designed to be boring because it shows how insidious people can use yeah. very boring ways to become incredibly evil. <laughs> right. Ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and you know what's what's interesting is people might not know this. The 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 original so Chinatown was meant to be one of a trilogy. This isn't adapted from a book. Uh, it was. Uh, it was a. I mean, it's a, a sequel. A, yeah. Yeah. It was a script uh, written by Robert Town. Robert Town was hired, I think, to. I can't remember what it was, but he was hired to adapt something else, and he said, "I can't do better than that." Uh, so I'll write my own story. And he ended up coming up with this. And very quickly, they were like, oh, okay, there's these wonderful broad characters. You know, Jack, Jack Nicholson in particular is great as Jake it is, but, you know, Faye Dunaway. And, well, <laughs> she obviously wouldn't have made a sequel. And But, you know, there's these, <laughs> great, there's these great characters. And then there was immediately this idea of doing the eventual sequel, The Two Jakes. But that didn't come out until, like, what, fucking 90? 90? 1990. Yeah, right? Yeah, like it was 25 years later, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, because I'm old enough to remember that being years, released. 
Yeah, mm. I can do that. So <laughs> in, in the original, it's like 74, you know? Yeah. So, so, and then there was meant to be one after that, which was about an older Jake Giddies and a divorce. And that was meant to be about air. But this was all about water. The two Jakes was about fire and earth or something. And, or electricity or whatever, <laughs> whatever. it was. And, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That so, was the so... that was the original plan, but they, they never went that far. But what's incredible about this movie is that it takes the commodity of water, which if you've ever lived in a desert state, as I have, as Christopher has, you don't think about it when you live in a part of the world where that's just not a big deal. But it is a big deal if you live in a place where you regularly have droughts and you, you're told you have to turn the water off and everything. And that's where this movie starts. That's the plot of this movie. It's about what happens when a state, when, when, when a, t a city as big as L.A. has this fundamental commodity taken away from it. What will happen next? And obviously it's the intrigue and the crime and the lies that go around essentially controlling the flow of water. Yeah. Uh, so which, yeah, <laughs> let me briefly summarize this. So basically, uh, Jake Geddes is played by uh, Jack Nicholson, and he is a, of course, it's film noir, a private detective. He gets hired mm -hmm. to track uh, the chief sing civil engineer of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power because he is allegedly having an affair. Now, he does this and takes photos of this man with a young woman. As we find out later, he's actually quite a noble person who is uncovering crimes and, you know, trying to meet members of his own family. Um, but it turns out that even the woman who came to hire him was f lying. She was a prostitute pretending to be this man's wife. Um, mm. And so whose name was his last name is Mulray. So Mrs. Mulray, his real wife comes by and says, hey, it wasn't me who hired you after these pictures of her husband end up in the newspaper somehow, thereby exposing this this infidelity to the public. Um, so it turns out that his wife then actually hires Jake Geddes and he starts tracking uh, her husband. Now, her husband is investigating himself as the chief engineer of the water and power department, missing water within the city. So effectively, water is there's a drought and people are complaining about not having enough water, particularly in the valley, which contains a bunch of farms. And they he starts going to these reservoirs and figures out that somebody is illegally dumping this water and then pretending there's a drought, right? And making the drought worse because the idea is to build this dam that he believes is unsafe. So they kill him, chuck him into one of the reservoirs. Then Jack Nicholson's character has to go investigate these murders, finds out that his, that Mulray's wife, Mrs. Mulray has actually been in an incestuous relationship where she was raped by her father when she was a, a teenager and gave birth to her daughter slash sister. And she's been hiding him away from their father who used to be Mulray's partner. That's John Houston, who plays a man named Cross. And I know this is very convoluted, guys. This is why you have to watch the movie. Describing these plots is always convoluted. Uh, Cross has been the puppet master the entire time. He's basically been diverting water, dumping water to make sure the farms don't get it so he can buy their land for cheap. Then he will build the dam, make the land more valuable, become even richer than he already is. Uh, in the process of this, he's paid off the police as well as part of this investigation. He's got a gang of thugs that are chasing uh, Faye Dunaway and Jack Nicholson around Los Angeles. And the end scene uh, we'll talk about later, but that's when Faye Dunaway's character gets killed by the police and Cross takes his daughter slash granddaughter into his own personal custody, probably to sexually assault her. Right, a couple of things to say here. One, when you said earlier that the, there was going to be a trilogy, and obviously there was a second movie, Richard, the funny mm. thing is, I actually am aware there's a second one, but I actually was going to say, but rhetorically, the joke is, the end of this movie, one of my first thoughts every time is... I want to see the sequel to this movie because essentially the, <clears throat> the position that character is in existentially at the end of the movie is what would be like a real film noir scenario. Like obviously yeah. one of the things they do as part of the homage to film noir here in the movie 
is they make, they use a lot of tropes that make you think it's going to be like a lot of old film noir movies. But as Monty said at the outset, they are able to do things you couldn't do in those movies. So they're also intentionally playing with that. And at the end, like that really, they, they're sort of like hopelessness at the end of like, you can't really beat the big bad as it were. That is that is fit film noir. Like I want to see what that guy, a cynical Jack Geddes does instead of some guy who thinks he can sort of like make it and stop the bad guys. And if you know, uncover all the corruption, it's the right thing. Like, actually, that's like quite a naive, like you're in the wrong movie, essentially. You're in the wrong genre, mate. Like that, that ain't for you. And then on the water thing, I actually think that's the cleverest part of the movie, Monty, is that the the entire water thing, it's not a red herring because it is the central like crime mm. mechanism of the film, but it is. It's not actually the main thing you end up caring about. You end up caring at the end about this woman, Faye Dunaway, and her daughter, and this like uh, essentially the idea that the guy who is doing the water scam can't get away with it. Like he's, he's already an evil piece of shit. He can't surely on a personal level also just get away with whatever he wants and show like, you know, corrupt power can do whatever they want. And the water angle is the most genius part because that's what that serves really well as like the part to make you not be able to figure out the plot of what's going on. Because as you say, it seems so boring. It seems so like, essentially it just seems almost like, is this just about like tax codes or like the law needs to be, you know, (laughs) some bullshit like that. Whereas actually, like you say, Richard, what people don't understand is when you're in somewhere like California, Nevada, it's actually that essentially that is the resource. If you don't have the water, you can't have... You can't have farms. If you don't have farms, you don't have the produce. You can't have the wine. You can't have anything. And what people don't know, I'll, I'll give people a little bit of supplementary watching here. If you've ever seen, there was a modern day show. It's on Amazon Prime called Goliath, right? Which has Billy Bob mm, Thornton as the central Billy character. Bob and he show, plays a lawyer, right? And it's a bit, it has elements of film noir in it. And in the mm. third season, this is actually one of the plot lines. What happens is, I won't give away any of the spoilers, but in the third season, it's all about <clears> the fact that in California, there's not enough water and there's droughts and who gets to control the water and why and who do they fuck over because that's the part people won't understand about this film until they really think about the plot is the whole premise is there will never be enough water to go around that is the whole point so the question is who gets it and that's what really is the crux of it like they're all they're, at the beginning they're making it sound like they have the tech solution they get, no no the whole point is like essentially as they describe there I don't think people get this places like California essentially shouldn't exist like at this point in the lifespan of the place we live they should be like an abandoned area that has small outposts or a little the idea you're going to build like a metropolis and then just ship a bunch of water in and pretend it's like you know New York or something is it such an alien sort of artificial concept right. that like unsurprisingly you almost like you imply that you'd have to have these problems like essentially the joke is like LA it's like built on this like concept of corruption like it could never actually run as the like exactly what he says dreams yeah we're yeah. built on the desert, and the desert will sweep over us unless exactly. we maintain this dam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, just just as a point out, the, some of the aspects of American history, like first off, like Las Vegas and Phoenix are much more egregious than Los Angeles. Like Los Angeles at least oh, has yeah. some water. But for those people who aren't American or don't understand the history of this region, as Thorne is saying, the entire no. Point... The other thing is, oh, Monty, it's not just LA though. People don't realize. I always, yeah. as a, I'll say this as a foreigner, people don't know how enormous California is, bro. I I'm <laughs> when I first went to an esports event, right? And I think Cloud9 told me their house was in San Diego. And I was like, I'm going to be in LA. I'll nip over. They were like, you won't. It's like three hours or something. I was like, what? And so people don't know. The real problem is like LA is the main city, but California, people don't know how much farming goes on there. It's enormous. Oh, yeah. And it's essentially just totally like, I think the only water is like in some Northern area and you have yeah. to like ship Look, it all the way down or something so, mental. Yeah. So what happened is like to solve this problem that that uh, Richard and Thorne were talking about, like they had to basically create Lake Mead behind the Hoover dam in Nevada and use the Colorado River. And if you guys have been paying attention to the news, you'll know that their water rights on the Colorado River are now a massive, massive like political issue because of the droughts that have been happening and the the lower water supply of the Colorado, which feeds like a bunch of states, um, including Nevada and Arizona and Southern California. In Northern California, the water problem, even around San Francisco, had to be dealt with pretty early on in that city's history. So what happened is they dammed a valley up by Yos- uh, in Yosemite called the Hetch Hetchy Valley, which was pretty vociferously opposed by a naturalist named John Muir, who became very famous. And it was actually the destruction of... Hetch Hetchy Valley, which was apparently astoundingly beautiful, and they dammed it up to fill it full of water for the Bay Area. Um, that actually f- caused the national park system to even be created because people realized that this was basically a crime against nature. So there has been a long-standing 
you know, in this region of the world, a longstanding uh, conflict around water rights, what, you know, what should be built in order to conserve the water, who gets the water rights in the first place, and, and where that water gets moved around to in the kind of American West and Southwest. The other thing yeah. to say as well is this. I actually think as well, pl reason plots like this are awesome is because when it's just like someone runs drugs or someone's murdering people, like th th those are two obvious topics that have been tackled a million times. Everyone can understand who the bad guy is there, why it's bad that he killed someone and they're dead now. So, you, can, you know, that person's deprived their life. I actually think subtler topics like this reveal a darker p evil in humanity. Like I've always thought, Monty, that the craziest thing about the modern world is that people actually think it's fine that like white collar criminals just get a slap on the wrist and then not like a harsh prison. It's like, you do know the guy who like fucks up a banking crisis can ruin millions of people's lives, cause a bazillion suicides, children beaten, drunken outrages, like a million things could go wrong, butterfly effect style from financial corruption that like no goon with a shotgun could ever do. He can only get what? Maybe like 20, 30 people tops he could kill. He could like abuse a few people. Like I actually think people have inverted essentially because it's about the class that you're from, isn't it? Like the point is the white collar criminal is is the person who runs society and manages it and makes the laws and decides it. So essentially, this water one's a great one because, again, it also sounds like it's just about the water, though. And you would think to yourself, how, da how dark could that get? It's like, no, it, you have to imagine it's like oil. It's like a fundamental resource that you must have in the area. And therefore, people are willing to do the most evil and heinous things ever. They will, like, And crucially, especially when there's an abstraction like that, the other reason it's like the financial one is you don't actually have to see the guy who, drow who, who has a drought and never gets any water his family and they their family farm clauses. You don't have to see the person that you fucked over. Here. Essentially, the only people getting killed are the ones you ordered to be killed. So it doesn't even seem to you maybe like you're that evil. Even though actually, it's pretty, if you look at what his actual plan was, the main guy here, it's pretty heinous. And lastly, I'll just tie this in. Just the casting alone of John Houston and what his character yeah. does <laughs> is an enormous, yeah. like, essentially, as far as I can tell, if I had to guess, that's why Polanski made this movie. Because if you don't know, John Houston is, like, the film noir director. Like, as we talked about, he did the the Maltese Falcon. It was he his first movie. So we, we, yeah, we started with yeah. his first Lago, yeah, yeah, all the classics. <laughs> and then also, oh, baby, think yeah. about this. This is why it's genius. So he directed all those movies, but as Monty said, during the Hayes Code era, where he could never put any of this other shit in. So they let him come back later as like essentially the ultimate villain in a film noir, doing all the shit you never could do. And by the way, towards the end of that movie, he just steals this movie. His yeah. his like speeches are fucking mega. Even the way like he the thing about that's so weird at the end is he's so creepy once you sort of know what his character's about. Like there is something that's actually terrifying. Like at the end of that movie, Richard, when I see him like pulling that girl away, I feel like I'm the jick and this guy. Like, what the fuck is everyone oh. just gonna allow this out for like holy shit she's taking it that's actually like i say i can't uh, under like over you legitimately like, that's you, yeah. you legitimately feel sick i mean it's apart horrible. from apart from i mean there's a nice little touch to it which was at the time jack nicholson who revered uh john houston was dating his daughter angelica so that <laughs> scene where he sits uh, Jack Nicholson down for dinner and goes, are you sleeping with my daughter? What are you charging her? My usual fee. What's the bonus if I get results? Are you uh, sleeping with her? Come, come, Mr. Gibbs. You don't have to think about that, remember? <laughs> and they do that thing. There's this extra edge to it. And the way John Houston at the end creepily takes away the woman that we've had revealed to to be his you know product of incest now the mother's dead been shot in this shootout uh it's it's insane how much having him there and his performance and how he really leans into it adds to the movie but i'll just say back back on the water th issue What's really cool about this movie actually is if you look into the history from the region, it is based in actual things that did occur. There was uh, the uh, so it starts with the uh, the the initial guy who gets murdered uh, is an engineer who refuses to build a dam because he said the last dam he built collapsed and it killed a bunch of people. And in 1928, there was the Saint Francis Dam collapse uh, in uh you know in la which killed 450 people it's one of the worst crises you know like that that's ever occurred 
at that time and they blamed the engineer being kind of self-educated and not being you know he didn't know enough about it and so there was this real fear that like we need dams we need water but what happens if the people building them don't have the people's interests at heart and so he's getting all this pressure to not build a dam he knows is a fugazi and then you essentially find out another reason he won't build the dam is because they're you they're going to use it to channel the water into a different region not the needy region where all the farm people and the arable land is not the people who need the water they're going to divert it to another area that they've been deliberately starving of water for a long period of time so they can sell it off on the cheap to a bunch of old people you know who just signed this mr lamar crab <laughs> and uh, uh you know and, and and so there's all these fantastic layers to this film but ultimately, it is it is a layer cake of corruption. What happens when every institution Public you encounter? Institution. Yeah, exactly. You know, the government, the council, the police. You know, everything's corrupt. Everything is viable. And and just before we talk about the next part, I will say Houston's line. He's got the line of the movie, probably. Uh, when Jack Nicholson sat down having lunch with him and he says, you seem to be, uh, what is it? He seems, you seem to be respectable. And he says, of course I'm respectable. I'm old. Politicians, built uh, ugly buildings and whores all get to be respectable if they live long enough. <laughs> of course I'm respectable. I'm old. Politicians, ugly buildings, and whores all get respectable if they last long enough. It's like, <laughs> wow, okay, I get, you know, you're immediately in that moment, you understand what the film's talking about. And by the way, I'll just throw this out there. Like, some of this might be, a, like, say, like a foreshadowing of the LA Confidential, because probably have seen the film mm. already. But essentially, yeah. if people wonder about that aspect of how corrupt and how dark it is, one of the things they couldn't make as explicit in the old movies, especially because, again, like, they didn't want to make the idea constantly. Like, uh, like they don't want a movie in 1940, unsurprisingly, where the message is like, all institutions are corrupt and there is no American <laughs> dream or way of life. Like, forget it. They, they obviously don't want that. They want the fucking upbeat ending, right? But essentially, if you watch this movie in LA Confidential, you don't have to ask why would the guy at the end who worked in Chinatown betray the jet guy because like the point of the movie is they have everyone on some sort of a hook they've got your photos of you with a prostitute they know if you've cheated on your wife they know if you were a cop who did some drug deal they have everyone on the hook that's the real that's why I said in a way I'd want to see the sequel because when you actually watch this film the joke is you're watching it thinking yeah, I'm watching film noir but then actually because it's so like updated and modern you actually realise like man film noir was an incredibly naive sort of premise <laughs> Store, wasn't it like <laughs> even the idea you ever could solve those murders or stop like massive of course you couldn't like this is more like reality like this is almost like reality impinges on what the film noir conceit is because of course at the end you can't really just run up to the cop like hey he's crazy get this guy here he's evil like you're nobody you're just some fucking gumshoe essentially like of course you're not going to win over that guy and that guy literally knows he's fucking one that's the worst part about it as well is that sort of like smug demeanor he has of sort of like oh go ahead gentlemen you know tell him what you it's like you just know this fucker can't be taken <laughs> down such a tr tragic in it i also yeah. think what's a, one of the more interesting aspects of this of this film in particular is it's not very common in film noir for the protagonist to be revealed as naive right and you know when you see yeah. when you see sam spade in the maltese falcon he is very cynical and he always has sure. kind of a quick line and he knows like the next step he's one step ahead of people in these conversations most of the time um and he's not really taken aback or flustered by what he's encountering but what you understand about jake Geddes is First off, he he comes to the wrong conclusions on several occasions, such as when he finds what he thinks are Mulray's glasses yep. in the pond. Yep. He assumes yep. that Mrs. Mulray murdered her, but it's not even her husband's glasses. It's her father's glasses. Nope. That By the way, had... even that, Monty, is a great example of like like almost reality impinging on the naivety yeah, yeah. of the film noir. Because in it, right, he goes straight to the villain and goes what like, I found your glasses. Yeah. And so yeah. then that guy just goes... Yeah. 
Henchman with a garden tick. <laughs> <glasses. laughs> yeah, what would you do that? You would be You fucking had it back to right. Like, no, exactly. Like he's fucking it up all the time. Of course, he's so naive. Or the he's not, that, by the know... way, there's even a line earlier which ends up being taught aging terribly, where he says to that sort of like Goomba type fucking guy, like, you know how long I've been in this business? It's like actually it sounds like five minutes, mate. You're getting wrecked by everyone. <laughs> yeah, so I find it very interesting that he is often the one who is arriving at the the erroneous conclusions, or he's not taking enough care. And and he really is kind of a cavalier character. One thing that really stood out to me in this movie is he's very quick to insult people, even when he's about, like, he can just easily get his ass beat and then does, right? Oh, he, and does. And yeah, does. And does. And, does. And, 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 and totally unnecessarily, by the way, if he just doesn't say anything, he just do wouldn't get hit. But he's so antagonistic to people for absolutely no reason. And he's not prepared for the violence that's coming his way, right? And it, it, you see it in scenes throughout the movie where he'll insult somebody, then he'll get hit. And at the end, it's like you you are you are acting without any awareness of the consequences. And that is the and ultimately, I think he finally realizes that this is his pattern of behavior at the very end because he is totally out of his depth to the point where. That's where you get the, the classic line, forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown, because he has to get pulled away by his like assistant private eyes, the people that he employs, uh, before he gets fucked up even further. Oh, so, right? there's 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 a there's there's a lot to that, right? So the first thing is obviously it is a subversion of the traditional noir hero in the sense that um, you know, Sam Sam Spade can fucking handle his business. Uh, Jake Giddies can. We do see him finally beat that dude Mulverhill to within an inch of his life. We do see that. Uh, but this is after he, he even some farmhands fuck him over. <laughs> you, know, you, you big dumb Oki, and he gets... <laughs> yeah, he exactly. Gets, the violence gets, is over, and then yeah. he just get hits again. Yeah, and again, because he, he calls yeah, him he a big dumb again. It's like, why would you do yeah. that? All raised dead. You don't know what you're talking about, you dumb Oki. <laughs> I, 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 but but what what I will say is I think this is actually v like pitch perfect because what you have to remember about the title Chinatown and and it's not just about that last line forget about it it's China you know forget it it's Chinatown um. It, Chinatown is a different time and a different place and about being a different person. That's what Chinatown is. Remember, Jake Giddes used to be a police officer. He used to be partnered with the guy, Lou, that's investigating this case. It's what gives him the input. It's what gives him the connections that he used to be, this corrupt police officer in Chinatown, which it's constantly referenced but in a very subtle way that it was just a bunch of police officers running around arresting people in a corrupt fashion There's i mean oftentimes extreme. like he says that, that when he talks to the da the D da told him to do as little as possible it's like they yeah. weren't even trying to police it really because they exa didn't exactly they, they didn't care what crimes happened in this like ethnic enclave they, yes they knew that if they ever needed to pin a public crime on a Chinese, you know, American Chinese, American Asian person, they could do it. They could go to Chinatown and do it. But they also knew if they ever needed to bump their stats, they could do that too. There's a there's an explicit line where he says, "You were arresting? Are you still arresting Chinese guys for spitting in the laundry?" You know, and and he says, "Ah, you know, a lot's changed since those days, Jake." Tell me, you still putting Chinamen in jail for spitting in the laundry? You're a little behind the times, Jake. They use steam mines now. And I'm out of Chinatown. <laughs> and a lot has changed, you know, and, and Jake's changed. And and so I see the way he behaves is this cynicism towards the system that he used to be in. And, and, it, and, and, and the hilarity about it is, like a lot of people who've been in the system and then reject it and leave the system and then speak out against it, 
they're the people who do get the shit kicked out of them actually <laughs> they're the activists they're the you know the people that know the truth the former politicians etc and it's brilliant it, it it's it's wonderful um just to the point as well about him holding up as a noir archetype yeah he does way more damage with his words than with his fists when he meets mulverhill the big ex-cop, a former guy who turned a blind eye, a bootleg bootlegging police officer. He says, what are you doing here? This is after he's talked to the head of police. And he, and he said, my water got shut off. That's why he's there at the municipal office. And he goes, well, how would you know? You don't drink it. You don't take a bath in it. And then he goes, let me guess, they sent you a letter. And he goes, no, no, it can't be that. Because then you would have to read it. <laughs> so he's absolutely... It's very funny. Hill, what are you doing here? You shut my water off. What's it to you? How'd you find out about it? You don't drink it. You don't take a bath in it. They wrote you a letter. But then you'd have to be able to read. You know, he's absolutely wrecked this guy. <laughs> you know, in that tradition of the Maltese Falcon, yep. when he when he he's doing it, it's it's fantastic and 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 sort of that that's what I love about Jake Gid is the character, is that he is out of his depth. Absolutely. He isn't physically capable of fighting off even more than two guys holy shit roman polanski carves his nose up and he spends <laughs> a third of the movie with a bandage on his face which is just wonderful which is for this iconic law and very yeah relevant. absolutely iconic, that bandage. But, yeah. But, but but that's what i love about this film it's that and what i love about the character is that he never backs down from the task even though we can all see you are this close to just getting killed and put in the river same way Mulray was. You need, yeah. you know, the the only thing that stops that from happening probably is the fact that you're you're juiced in with Faye Dunaway. <laughs> 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 you know, which it's just wonderful, wonderful to see Jack Nicholson do this the way he does it. It's brilliant. That, I also think as well that's why the plot being about this bigger, almost like councils and government thing of the water mm. board and all that shit is like an interesting, like like I say, almost like a red herring or distraction. Because the other thing is, if this guy just worked as a detective in Chinatown, like, like as you see, that if people don't know, that's where all the heroin smuggled in, etc and all mm. that sort of jazz. So as a result, like that's a totally different environment. And then the mistake this person makes is thinking like essentially his environment scales or is like a one-to-one -one with all other industries in the world. Whereas like it may be in that scenario, you can go and arrest the person who's dealing the drugs or doing the corruption. Like maybe if it's low level enough, you can, but what he doesn't understand is like, as we're talking about, once you get to this level, now it's all institutional. Now there's like people, now there's like rich interests tied into it. And you can't actually know, this is the other mistake this character makes. It's funny enough, a topic in LA Conference too is the idea yeah. that like because you can't know how how deep the corruption goes half the time you think you're actually like getting closer to solving it but you're like giving info to the other person involved in it who's fucking you or getting someone killed or like <laughs> see in in this scenario like one of the messages of this movie that i want to actually get to because this is the theme of this movie and i think it's a bigger uh, um theme in cinema in general in hollywood specifically is a lot of people have this opposite take to me which is they think actually that cause hollywood is like artists and people who created that in some way even though hollywood is this cynical you know movie industry that just cares about money in the bottom line they think that the people who make the movies though are trying to win their own like compromised way you know they're trying to be white hats they're trying to like send the message to the world that you know you can be a hero you can stand it no no the conclusion of all hollywood movies like this is if you are the one who stands against the many and the great power, the best case scenario is they let you walk away your life and you accomplish nothing. Worst case, they just kill you. They crush you flat. You're a bog. You'll never, ever defeat institutional power. That is always the theme that emerges. And this movie, by the way, it hits that like a motherfucker at the end. Like, that's why yeah. it is just trying to tell. Essentially, it's like, mate, it's not even worth you like looking into this more. Otherwise, you're just dead. That's it. Your choice now, basically, is walk away or you're dead. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's even one of the things I think is still so crazy is if you've never seen the movie, I mean, obviously you have to have seen this, but like you would never ever predict, by the way, that they, the cops <laughs> are the ones who shoot the Faye Dunaway character at the end. Like That is such an insane <laughs> ending to a movie. By the way, one other thing I thought I'd thrown there uh, that I do think, I'm going to do a Richard here on like Fright Night, where it's probably just some shit that they did badly in the movie or written, but I'm going to defend it and find a way to explain <laughs> that it's actually like some genius intentional okay. thing. I think it was an intentional homage 
homage to like 40s and 50s style film noir where they do that stupid scene where he discovers that she's both the sister and the daughter, right? Where she goes, like they're slapping her and she's like, she's my sister. It's my daughter. It it's is my really sister. bad. Because it's almost like some like ridiculous 40s level. Like, Because aside from it's that, like remember, like, dude, in this movie, Faye Dunaway does a great job. She does a mega job, I actually think, as a femme fatale. I, think... I was surprised how good she was. But that scene there is like some 40s shit. Man. said I want the truth. She's my sister. She's my daughter. My sister, my daughter. <laughs> That was like hilarious. No, when that, I, was actually, that. <laughs> I actually think that scene is sort of the it, it's the it, it 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 it's silly, but it's only silly in the sense that it's a physical representation of no more bullshit. Like Jake it is has been led around by his nose by almost everyone the whole fucking movie, particularly by Faye Dunaway's character. And he yep. is you know, he's saying no more. So she goes and uh, yeah, it's we shouldn't uh, Sean Connery would love this scene. Oh, <laughs> he, 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 the sister <laughs> The the daughter, the sister, the daughter, I mean, and yeah, he's slapping her around. It, it got results, didn't it? You know, it did work. But like what what's but what what's what's wild about the scene is that you're you're sort of watching it going, yeah, actually, what the fuck is going on? And he hits her and he hits her and he hits her, and then it dawns on you, oh my god, actually, oh shit. She confesses to this horrible thing and in that moment you know you realize she isn't the femme fatale that the movie is sort of held her up to be yep. she's a tragic victim of abuse and here's jake giddies abusing her again i actually will go so far i'll stand for that scene actually i i get it it's... it looks silly on its face but what but what is actually happening in that scene although a broadly physical representation of what the protagonist is going through. And remember, it's all from Jake Giddes' viewpoint in this movie, unlike LA Confidential, which we'll get to. Um, you know, that's why. That's why it happens and plays out the way it does. So, no, I'll actually defend the scene. No, I, no, no, no. I, I it's get, not, it's I not about the silly. slapping. It it's silly. not, it could be, the slapping could be done differently, Richard. I think uh, what it's I agree with, the way it's, the, the way it's the way yeah. it's done. He could slap her. I want to make a skit and transpose this scene into esports and have like Nicola and I on six years ago. I'm the owner of Astralis. Wait, heroic. Astralis, heroic. You know, like, there's so many it's things. It's funny. Mechanism, exactly. It's just good. Listen, right? The, it, what look, you have to also remember No, no, no. If you, think about this. If you put this in The Simpsons, it would be fucking hilarious. Oh, yeah. this, this is like a Simpsons I thing. Dad, I think he's okay. Oh. I don't know how many of you have read Easy Riders Raging Bulls uh, by Peter Siskind. It is probably, if you're into movies, the greatest book ever written. Um, it talks about the auteur era and all of the great films that you would expect from the title across the 70s and 80s. And it has an insane amount of depth about Chinatown. And what's okay. interesting about this movie is apparently Faye Dunaway was at the peak of her diva arc. There are some oh. legendary stories about this shoot. Jack Nicholson had persuaded, he was friends with Roman Polanski and friends with Faye Dunaway, and he persuaded Faye Dunaway to come work on this film, and Roman Polanski agreed. Um, so to give you an example, I've, I've literally got it written down here because I, I, went, I went through the book uh, before the, the recording. And, um, okay, so she wouldn't flush the toilet on set. She refused to flush her own toilet. And every time she took a shit or a piss, she would get a teamster to come and she would be like, you teamster, come flush this toilet. Uh, and, and, it, and and loads of teamsters said, like, what am I doing, dude? I'm here to build sets and all this. And, and they would walk out on the set. There was one time Roma Polanski got wind of that and said, okay, 
if you don't want to flush your own toilet, you're just not going to get a toilet break in the shooting. So he made her do a prolonged shoot where she didn't get to take a piss. And she said to him, you're a fucking animal. She was screaming at him, calling them all these names. Anyway, when the, when the shoot finished, she walked off set, went to the side. She took a paper cup from like the catering or whatever, pissed in it and threw it in Roman Polanski's face. So <laughs> this is meant to be the height of her diva arc. So when you think about that scene and how, you know, gentle and better, you know, it sort of makes sense when you think about it from that perspective. That being said, I do want to say, I won't make the joke about she can throw a cup of piss in my face anytime she wants. Uh, I won't do oh, that. Oh, she's fighting uh, this movie, though. <laughs> she is, yeah, absolutely. She's what I mean. will say, you can cut that out if you want. What I will say is, um, I do get the sense, actually, that given the sensitive nature of some of the material that they had to handle, I think, yeah, maybe it loses a dash of realism because I... It, you know, they don't really roughly handle her. It's not a very convincing scene. Even at the end when she gets shot, you don't see it until she leans back with the makeup and it's for a split second that her eyes yeah. out. Doesn't so I, I, fuck, I have to say. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, so she looks I, like I, 9,000 or whatever's about like regenerated. <laughs> it's fucking like, looks like that, doesn't it? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I do think probably with gone. all of the stories about her being at the peak of a diva arc, it probably did impact on performance and you know those scenes a little bit and they lost some of their impact. But, but I will defend what happens within the scenes as it extends to. The storyline, she is a victim, she's a perennial victim. Ultimately, the story, when you boil it down, yeah, it's not, yeah, we're all victims. We're all getting robbed by the robber barons and having our water taken away from us and all this. But this big, broad topic, when you get down to it, it's that the wealthy can do what they want. They can even do deplorable things to their own children, their own progeny. And and get away with it. Well, it's all, and, and, it's, it's also and that's Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, it's also that you know what I think is one of the more interesting aspects of the the theme of corruption in this movie is that you know uh, there's there's a couple aspects. One of which is that Cross and Mulray owned the water supply prior to making it a public utility, which Mulray wanted to do. And the yeah. idea was is that this was some. It, we're supposed to believe this was a philanthropic act that people shouldn't privately own the water supply in Southern California. And yet at the end of the day, even the public institution ends up being corrupted by literally the same man who used to own it, right? He can still pull the strings. So what is disguised as something owned by the people for the public good is really just a mm. tool of the same rich people that originally owned it in the first place. You know, it's the aristocracy never goes away, even in the democratic, you know, allegedly democratic society of America, which I think is a, is hugely influential. And the other thing, too, is that the good men in this movie are marginalized or killed and even suspected mm. first. Right. I think that's what's so interesting about Mulray, the character, is we really don't see much of him. Uh, at the start of the movie, he, you know, we see Jack Nicholson go to a speech or a, a city council meeting where he's saying he's not going to build the dam because it's dangerous. So fuck you guys, basically fuck the private interests. I won't make, I won't make the same mistake twice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, so he's seen as an upstanding person with moral character, but at the same time, the opening of this movie is him being suspected of infidelity and a private eye. Um, following him around and trying to figure out what he's up to and shadowing him as he is doing his own investigation of what is happening to this water, right? And so he is made to seem like the villain, which we later understand is completely untrue. And in fact, he rescued the woman who became his wife yep. from his corrupt business partner. He has been, we don't really understand the relationship Can't with mistake twice. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's the beauty of it. You know, he, he, he saved this kind of forlorn girl that we know now, you know, similar relationship to his wife initially. 
That's the thing. Like, there's loads of foreshadowing in right. this movie. And, and, and here's the, you know, there's so much ambiguity. So we also, because he's going to meet Catherine, which is his wife's daughter slash his sister-in-law, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we assume that's because he's trying to help her in some way, right? Or take mm -hmm. care of her in some way. As we find out later on, that's probably his most likely motive. Even Mrs. Mulray herself says repeatedly, you know, he was a very basically says he was a, a very good man, right? And yeah. also the implication through this movie too is that they might not even have a sexual relationship. Um, because remember that, it, it, you know, he he allowed her to flee to Mexico when she was still a young teenager to take care of her. And it's implied that they are having, they are both having affairs outside of the marriage, but it's never really implied that they had sex. So it's almost as though you could assume potentially that he married her when she got older in order to take care of her, not because yes. there is a legitimate romantic relationship between the two of them. And so in a way, Mulray, we don't ever actually get to see a conversation with him really, but he is a good man who should be in a position of power, who comes from immense wealth, who gave basically the thing he owned to the city of Los Angeles for the public good. And even he is like, he could be the best man possible in a position of power. And even he is helpless against the corruption, right? Yeah, Which is I actually powerful. think, public, oh, go on. Publicly ridiculed. I was going to say, I'm publicly ridiculed. I mean, right from the very first scene. Right. This Even though guy he wasn't having, he was in the newspaper falsely accused yes. of having an affair. Yeah, he's literally there saying, guys, the last time we built a dam like this, I was conned into believing this scientific data. The, the, the silt won't hold the dam. And it killed so 500 people. And it, and it killed 500 people. And I have to live with that. And then that dude brings in his flock of sheep. <laughs> Fucking love that scene. He just brings in his sheep and goes, what are we going to do about them? <laughs> what are we going to do about them sheep, sir? <laughs> and again, as he's like packing up his papers and has to walk away. It's like, this is a good man. A good man who is, through the lens Jake Giddies sees the world, can't possibly be as good as he is. And that's how he ends up being disgraced and eventually winds up dead. Jake Giddies certainly plays his part in that and then essentially tries to atone for it, but it's too late. Good people can't exist in the world of Chinatown. I don't know if people really realize because the movie takes on such a roller coaster and by the end, you can barely remember where it began. Since the movie begins, remember the actual starting conceit essentially is Jake Geddes is actually helping the fucking evil people. He's because he's yeah. been sold a false bill of goods that he's like investigating, you know, like infidelity. He's actually inadvertently setting up this good man we're talking about. Like immediately there's that element. Then think about when the Faye Dunaway character ar arrives, right? She immediately does like a lawsuit or something against him right and then because of this storyline like you're saying Monty where when he confronts her like but you've been out that implies you've had affairs that also then makes you think right she is the femme fatale she's just some cynical bitch who's with this guy for whatever money power then later when you find her with that woman who turns out is her daughter you assume right she's actually now kidnapped the woman he's dating and she's <laughs> keeping like essentially they do a really good job of like I've mentioned on past episodes they don't violate the Raymond Chandler rule which is you never lie to the yeah. audience you never show them something fake that was a dream that you don't tell them till later and get no what you do here is we just because we're in Jake's position like Monty says like the POV we're just getting the same info but because of the order and the timing of the info it's making us draw the wrong conclusions well, we're thinking she's this person whereas actually as you say Monty at the end she was just a victim all along well, actually she wasn't yeah. doing almost anything evil and even even Noah Cross uh Houston's John Houston's character is trying to convince Jake that uh that Mrs. Mulray is a danger to Catherine, that she mm. is unhinged. And because uh, Mulray was, you know, quote, cheating on her, unquote, with this other woman. Yep. And so he tries to pay Jake to go and find this girl, which we later know has been the granddaughter that has been hidden from him in, in a, you know, a different uh, house within town. She had been intentionally held from him to prevent his abuse, basically.
Because there's even an element there I think people might also miss, which if you've watched a lot of film noirs, they intentionally are trying to imply this as a red herring, which is that, like, one of the cool things about the femme fatale notion, like I pointed out on one of the past episodes, is it actually re-empowers women with a power they have always had called soft power slash influence. Like, think about this, right? In, in a way, a femme fatale is like the boss who's the evil guy. He doesn't kill you himself. He gets someone else to kill you. If he's really smart, he gets someone who unrelated to kill you, and he gets his way anyway and it looks like something different so one of the things and she doesn't end up doing this in this movie because as I say it's a red herring but in most other movies when you introduce to the femme fatale character like the one from the Maltese Falcon it's like the Faye Dunaway character says in this movie sure she la femme look to the woman what's the woman doing in the story normally the woman it's it's actually a sort of film noir reveals the transactional nature of even romantic relationships which is that if you're in a relationship with someone where there's any conflict of interest like you also could help them in their business or against an enemy or something that is all always yep. ever present and you have to always be aware of it and the main character when they ignore that that is what normally fucks you in a film noir that's what normally leads you down the wrong path or the wrong person gets killed so it's actually very clever they set it up like that because it makes you inherently suspicious of the Faye Dunaway character and think like she must at the end be like at a minimum you think she's had like a husband killed she's maybe in the corruption like what in fact it's even clever that it turns out in the end the real secret was just a personal family secret that she was ashamed of but you think because she's not being totally honest and she's doing that thing like they all do the femme fatale where the only thing what you sort of build them on. Yeah, yeah you're thinking, I mean, right, she must be in some way deeper shit. But in the end, the joke is actually, she was innocent. Yeah, she was just a, just yeah. another person caught up in this. I mean, compare this, to, compare this to the femme fatale in The Maltese Falcon, right, who is running everything behind the scenes and is yep, being exactly. duplicitous yes. to try and get yep. the Falcon, right, and basically set up, you know, his partner to die. And, and it's very different yep. this time where it is really just a personal tragedy that is causing her to uh, be duplicitous in many ways. And, mm. and she doesn't even know that the murder of her husband happened at her house, right? She, she has no idea yes. that that occurred. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think, look, what, what you know, it, it actually, one thing I will say, out of the four movies we, we cover in, in this film noir thing, we didn't get the ultimate classic uh, film, film noir uh, femme fatale, which is uh, from uh, probably, I would say, uh, Phyllis Dietrichson from Double Indemnity. <laughs> She she is the ultimate. I mean, that one was fucking... on the edge because I'm a huge fan of <laughs> I know, that movie. I know, I fucking love that movie, right? But if you need them uh, for the, I won't say Zoomers. I know Zoomer watches our stuff. But if you want to see some like modern examples, um, what's her name? Whoever Sharon Stone's character is from Basic Instinct, sure. that is a very good example of a modern day femme fatale. I think recently, uh, Gone Girl is a good example if you've seen that. Um, you know, Rosamund Pike's character in that. But this is the thing. Like, the whole genre is littered with women that are... They play up to misogynistic men's beliefs that women are always victims in everything they ever do. Exactly. And so yes. they, they put some tears in their eyes. Oh, no, my husband. And even the idea, Richard, that if you're pretty, yeah. you must be innocent. You know, it's all these weird ideas we have in psychology. Listen, isn't it? Yeah. Listen, well, I know I know an innocent face when I see one. Exactly. So I'm going to yes. go get your husband. What, he's dead? Yeah. What, you've been playing me the whole time, sister? <laughs> Why, Ayana? And it's so, that, that that's the, one of the, the things I love about film noir is there are no gender disparities, really. Everyone gets to be what the story needs them to be. It don't matter. Guy, woman, you know, dame, you know, <laughs> dude. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, a, 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 a private detective with 20 years experience can get the runaround by a fucking yes. pretty face or a grieving widow if the story needs it to happen that way. And this is what's beautiful about Chinatown is that I say everything is almost a little subversive twist on the on the classics jake Giddis isn't really a tough guy he's not really a tough guy he gets the shit kicked out of him all the time 
and in a, in almost comedic fashion, I, and when, is surprised by it every time, and refuses to carry yeah, a gun yeah, for reasons yeah, that yeah. I don't understand. He's like, "Will <laughs> not." That is the yeah, low key, a Hollywood yeah. trope I have always loved, though, which is as you're talking about, it's that weird thing they started doing from the eighties, even the seventies movies, mainly from the eighties onwards, where everyone's always like Spider Man in a comic. They're always like wisecracking, but in a way that would just get your ass handed <laughs> yeah. to you. Like the best example yeah. ever of it, by the way. But he does this intentionally. But I'll just reference this because we're not talking about this movie is in the classic movie, The Usual Suspects. Early on in the movie, oh, yeah. if you remember, they have that scene where they're all getting interrogated, right, and they're <laughs> on the police lineup. And my favourite whatever is that guy, I forget his name, that comedian, Kevin, whatever his name is, who plays that character. He has the best example of this ever, like a guy who's just ridiculous wisecracking. Because in it, right, they when they're interrogating him, they're trying to put the pressure on him, Monty, so one of the cops goes like, you know what happens if you do another turn around the block or whatever, like, you know, in prison or something, or like in like San Quentin or something. And he just <laughs> falls. He goes, in the he goes, he goes, I don't know, fuck your father in the shower and have a snack and then they just like instantly punch him in his face like the second he says that like but it's like the best example I've ever seen of someone like intentionally like like that like what do you think yeah. happens after you say that to a cop like obviously he just yeah. absolutely beats your ass to me like he doesn't go like in some friends episode like great line like you got me on that one like he's just gonna kick your ass by the way that's also by the way a classic trope as well that's another thing I found actually what notice we almost never talked actually about Jack Nicholson here I actually do yeah, think true. it's funny because even though Jack Nicholson's in this movie what you're going to think, well, he's way younger. He's actually not that young even when he's in this movie. But the weird no. thing is, Jack Nicholson's whole career is actually being an older actor. A lot of people don't even know a lot of his earlier movies are around the, like, basically, aside from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I think most people only know him when he becomes, like, the ridiculous Jack Nicholson who's chewing up the scene. And he's not really done that in this movie, but you do see hints of it. And actually, I actually have to say, I think he's one of the few people in this movie I think you could have recast. Like, I don't think I he's necessary really in this movie at nah, all. Like, like, he tried to <laughs> do the sort of, like, Having a bit of personality, I didn't. I, it didn't play that well for me. I thought he could have been almost any insert for this character. Every other, the other characters were well cast. This one, I thought was a yeah. bit whatever. Do, do you want to know who agrees with you, Duncan? Come Jack on. Nicholson. No <laughs> really? joke. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in an interview, um, a rare interview with those incredible journalistic bastions, MTV. They, it was, I believe, it was in 1990 when when Two Jakes got released. Uh, the 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 role was specifically written for him, and uh, in '74 okay. it was like literally, this is a Jack Nicholson vehicle, and he said like you know I took it um, because I, I didn't know any better then, but he said had I known it would be a very restrictive role, I wouldn't have took it because I like to color outside the lines, which obviously, if you know his oeuvre, if you know his entire fucking output, Jack Nicholson is a guy who <laughs> restraint isn't in his vocab. Let's just put it that way. Which, by the way, has given some of the best. I mean, like, oh, you know, it. No, no, no. I say this with affection. He's sort of like a pro tour Nicolas Cage. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, but, and, and, so and, so me. about Jack Nicholson, but fair enough, you know. As 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 I've said, uh, one one flew over the cuckoo's nest and the shining. This is a masterclass of. Oh, sure. Lo you know, losing your mind in real time in cinema. Only Jack Nicholson could play those roles. Um, yes. Now, but but yeah, you're right. This is not a typical Jack Nicholson performance by any stretch of the imagination, nor is it a typical role, because it's somebody who, outside of the wisecracking, it's not what you associate with Jack Nicholson. It's, it's oh. a boring role. Like, the thing is, is that everyone else in the film is designed to be more interesting than jake Geddes. like like that's just you know, how the role this is what's ruined it i've just ruined the whole movie for myself here's why when i explain <laughs> it to you and it, only this audience will understand because general <laughs> film critics won't know video games here's what ruins the movie essentially jake Geddes's character monty is just like fucking monkey island he goes around wisecracking <laughs> to people and solving basic clues <laughs> like <laughs> this goes here and then oh i have to remember that last scene there was another detail and there's even they even do a chekhov's gone with that pond where he's about to fish out those glasses yep. and he goes yeah. actually forget about that i'll just come back in an hour and a half and do that it's probably like the key piece of evidence <laughs> It is just Monkey Island. It's just fucking Monkey Island. There you go. I've nailed it. The, the Guybrush Threepwood right reference is exactly. very good, there actually. Go. There you go. I mean, I'm talking about video games, uh, you know, interestingly enough, and I, I didn't want to get into this. I, I just wrote it down as a little note. But uh, obviously, the uh, great 
L.A. Noir. I fucking love you that know, game. It, oh, boss, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is Chinatown, the video yeah. game, essentially. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it couldn't it couldn't get more nailed on, which I, I, I think really shows that, yeah, you, you, you probably, I, I think it speaks volumes, by the way, to how good this movie is, that it, it's not dependent on performance in the way a Maltese Falcon is. A Maltese Falcon without Humphrey Bogart doesn't work. No, Simple as that. Film. Yeah, it wouldn't it just simply wouldn't, you know, touch it evil without awesome wells. What are we <laughs> we, we wouldn't be talking about that movie. The garbage. What, yeah, but what what what's interesting is between uh the script, the screenplay I should say, because obviously it's not an adaptation, and the direction and the way everybody stays within these very set parameters to make it work a wonderful cast of actors um across the board chinatown you get you just get to talk about the movie it's not a flawed movie with fantastic performances it's an excellent movie irrespective of the performances within it it's very rare you get to say that yeah, you know, he, especially he, he, because a lot of the characters who are not the three main characters of Faye Dunaway, Jack Nicholson, and John Houston are very throwaway actors for the most part. Like they're not putting yeah. out but nowhere, then you look nowhere near compelling are, you, you know, performances. But if you actually look up the cast, some of those throwaway actors are like fucking just god tier actors that just had like a walk on part because they just wanted to be in the movie. It's like it's actually crazy how good the cast is uh, when you sort of look at it. Like, um, uh, what's uh, James Hong is the fucking butler? That's oh, yeah, Lopan. True. Or David Lopan, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's David Lopan. Lopan is yes. on the screen. Exactly. For two minutes. <laughs> and he, <laughs> and, and <laughs> in that time, <laughs> he bugs off Jack Nicholson. Are you yeah. fucking treating? So, dude, yeah. that's, and I'm missing out a ton of names. Uh, but, but this, this film, I, I think it's almost, it, it's that the strength of the story really stands alone and, and, the, and, and the execution of the direction yes. because it is such a complex story that to tell it in a comprehensible way that is interesting is really difficult and requires basically perfect writing and perfect pacing oh yes. by the way yeah. if you watched in this movie like sadly obviously everyone who watches it now will have seen the movie to watch this episode it's very few people are going to like use the spoiler if for some reason you're one of the weird people who doesn't mind it being spoiled don't if you start watching this and the first half an hour seems too dense, like Monty said, don't worry. Actually, like the movie itself will unravel the rest for you. Like it's not one of those ones where it's like some like spy thriller, like oh, I've lost the who was it, who did that first and who was the but it's not that co it, it seems very complicated initially and dense, but like it I can't say Monty. The, I think yeah, I'm not a massive Polanski fan, but I do think he is very good as a director. Like I think his raw like skill for shots and telling a story is very good. And I think he does an awesome job with this movie. Like, put it this way, this movie is like something like two hours and fifty. 15 minutes or two hours 20 minutes long it doesn't feel like it it's actually even though it has yeah. like quite a lot happens in yeah. it it's not a boring move it doesn't drag like it's actually very well paced i think but then i've got a well, couple of smaller details towards the end here if we want to chuck some stuff in yeah so on, yeah well, i was just gonna yeah, say well, just before I'll, we I'll move on from yeah just before we move on from polanski as a as a director i'm not gonna get obviously we all know Right. We're Obviously intentionally not addressing the elephant in the room, yeah. exactly. I'm going to say it on Polanski. You know that whole thing about that character at the end where it's like weird with like a young girl. Like, no, weird. Oh, and that guy gets well. away, does he, at the end? Does he get away with Polanski? Can no one yeah. get him? Can the institution protect him? <laughs> oh, not really? Well, it's just like the word she's saying. Yeah. I literally wrote down the ending Polanski. Yeah. Yeah. It's right there. I, it, uh, it, is, no. it is outrageous how no. uh, badly that aged in the context of his own life. Obviously, don't think about that when you watch the movie. It will ruin the movie for you. Just try to forget here's, whatever he might have done in real life. Don't worry about that. Here's, here's what I will say. I think out of all of uh, Polanski's films, I, I agree. I think one of the things Polanski is very good at is telling... So you take a very small, tight-knit community, group, family, whatever it is, but you tell a story that has broader ramifications. I think if you look at, like, Rosemary's Baby, Repulsion, uh, Frantic... I, I have a confession. I actually yeah, low-key love The Ninth Gate, even though it's fucking terrible. 
It's well, right. okay. <laughs> I mean, no, you're right. It sort of is kind of terrible, but yeah. But also, I do but really this is what I mean. He's brilliant, though. Like the actual premise is really cool. It's a yeah. really interesting plot. Yeah. P P Polanski is kind of very good at that. He's just never done it better than this. I don't think. I think this is Polanski's best film by some distance. I say that as a fucking real big fan of Rosemary. It's a baby. shit joke. I've come up with one of my shit jokes I would normally do on an eSports event, but it's what about a it? sensitive topic, so I'll say it anyway. The obvious joke would be, Richard, I'll bet if he actually given, was given a choice of any script to work with in the world, Polanski would probably do his own remake of Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's not bad. bad. That's not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> what else do we get the chance to run fucking Roman Polanski on a broadcast? <laughs> Whatever, there you go. Can can't wait to get cancelled over a exactly. Roman Polanski interview. Uh, oh, but, 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 don't forget, just because it is yeah. relevant, uh, even though it's childish, I did laugh my ass off at that joke about the Chinaman Richard, the one about having oh upsets. Oh my like, God. Even though it's <laughs> Berlin Man in Level Let's Two, I did, I did laugh that. quite a lot. Let's talk about that because it's important within the context it's of the movie, joke, actually. It? It's actually. No, but here's the thing. So for those watching the film, what you might not be aware of is like uh, it, it, th there's a way it sets up that Jake Giddies isn't going to be your Sam Spade tough yes. character and it's this. So after he's done his initial investigation into Faye Dunaway's husband and what he just believes is a common or garden affair uh, he goes into a barber shop and he's sat there and, and the photos he took has leaked into the public and it's JJ Guinness, you know, and it's all over there. And some guy, a bank manager, a mortgage broker, is sat next to him going, nice way you make your living, pal. And, and, and Jack Nicholson's going, you want to step outside and talk about it? Da, 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 da. But anyway, to calm him down, the barber tells him a racist joke, right? And the racist joke is that apparently Chinese people have a particular way of having sex. And so what's what? how this works is, in the scene prior to that, he snatches the photos out of his assistant's hand and goes, these photos don't prove anything. You know, there's a certain amount of finesse required for this job. He goes, he goes to get his luxury shave. He nearly gets in a fight. But then he comes back and he's going, guys, guys. He sends the secretary out. He gets the guys in the office. And he tells this racist joke about how Chinese people like to have sex. And this is how, you know, they, they do it in stages. And, and so this... A guy who's not Chinese does it in stages and his wife goes hey you're screwing like a Chinese guy meaning she's been she's cheated on him with a Chinese right. yes. and, and, and Jack Nicholson thinks this is hilarious but as he's telling the joke and his assistant's going please don't tell this racist joke now this is when Faye Dunaway's character is introduced and so he's literally said in the prior scene, you have to have some finesse in this job, you bums. You'll never understand it. Now gather around while I tell you a racist joke while our mega wealthy client just walks in. It's actually brilliant. It's like... It shows that he's it, kind it, of a buffoon, right? Which is... It, 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 it's more. It's obviously, the office. I get it, it's the fucking, I get it it's, that it's, it's just... Here's the thing. I get that it's a movie, so obviously people can't react the way they would. But those two characters, the Fair Dunaway and the other, they just stand there for like five minutes while he tells them. They're like, they don't, uh, you know, they just start, just let him hang himself. What? They did try to They did try to stop him, but then he shut them down. Please, no, please go. No, no, but yeah, listen. That was the ones in front. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, but what I, what I like about that is uh, because, obviously, again, within the context of the film and within the context of the 70s, it's wildly inappropriate. Um, but it's not only wildly inappropriate, it also, because the film is set in 37, and the idea of Chinatown and American Asian people being the other, it re it's illustrative of the theme throughout the movie, which, again, comes into the last line, which I think is a good thing for us to get onto now. And that is, you know, forget it. It's Chinatown. What is well, Chinatown? 
That's something though, Rich, without making a big digression, because I've got unlimited time for this one. I'll just say though, that yeah. is actually one thing I think is, has been ruined in modern movies, is this stupid notion that a modern movie must be representative of current political opinions, and it's therefore like, sure. it would be racist to put this joke in. As Richard's pointing out, it's actually flavour for the fucking time period. Like, yep. it actually makes sense. It's a bit like that thing where people said, like, why did they say a certain word in Django Unchained? It's like, it's pretty fucking essential if you want it to seem plausible, doesn't it? Like, how could you have a movie where they never said that word, but that premise existed. Like, that would be the the weird artifice, wouldn't it? Like, the point is, we I, don't I, agree with it because it's on screen. <laughs> it's also important to, to understand that the constant references to Chinatown as being this lawless, weird other part of L.A. where all these fucked up things went on. The fucked up things that we know about... Were white uh, people. Uh, the po <laughs> white people <laughs> abusing their power to lock up American Asians. And yeah. as I said, when James Hong, who has a two minute cameo as a butler, he gets to talk down to Jack Nicholson's character, albeit briefly. It, there's this wonderful subtext to the movie. And I know I always go on about subtext. I'm not doing it this time. We don't need to. Plenty of text to get into with Chinatown. But 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 I I I I think actually that little racist joke at the start exposes Jack Nicholson's character as a buffoon. It's it's funny on its face because of the setting he tells it in, but also within the broader context of what is Chinatown. It's amazing, actually. It, it's imp you if you take that out the script, modern sensibilities. I tell you, it's a worse movie for it. That's that. Those are the facts. I'm I'm sorry if that upsets a BuzzFeed reader. It's just the <laughs> truth. Um, but but uh, this is what I want to get to. The last line. Forget it. It's Chinatown. What what is Chinatown? What is that last line saying? Because I think that is the profound part of the film. That's the part that stays with you. I remember my uncle, my, my uncle Paul, bless him. He was a military dude, and he loved Jack Nicholson, and he used to show me movies all the time. And sometimes they were cheesy action films, and sometimes they were westerns. My cousins are called John and Wayne. He named them after John Wayne. My female cousins are Christine and Jolene. <laughs> Jolene after the song uh, uh, but he showed me Chinatown amongst this like I used to go around his house when my mother was working or whatever and uh, he, he showed me Chinatown he said because he loved Jack Nicholson he was like you will love this movie I must have been about 8 years old the first time I saw Chinatown and at the end he was sat on the sofa while I was watching it and when he said forget it it's Chinatown he was like looking at me like as if an eight-year-old would understand it or whatever, you know. He's like, Chinatown, and I, 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 yeah, it is. It's Chinatown. Is everyone dead? I don't get it, Paul. What's going on? You know. But as I've got older, I don't. I don't think there's a better line to sum up. Oh, it's a banger. How you can't win. <laughs> No, you the joke is, is, in a way, Richard, that line actually shows the skill of like whoever wrote the script or the film itself. Because mm. think about this, right? Normally, in a, I tell you what, in a modern Hollywood movie, this is actually how they do it. They would just have a character give five minutes of exposition of what the movie was. Yes. Like, oh, yeah, well, yeah. you see what happened was like, that was like a good person and now he's going to get it. And they would just do that for a dumb audience. Like, you're right, that one line actually just contains everything I just said, but like implied within it. It's like, they nail it. Like, there doesn't need to be another line after that in the movie. Like, once you hear that line and they walk, away yeah that is that's the end of the film right two quick things before we end one is i we didn't mention this earlier but i actually thought one thing that was quite cool as well was unlike a lot of film noir early on to show that he's a detective in the vein of a classic film noir they have him actually you see actually some of his techniques i thought it was quite interesting that thing where he takes the stopwatch and he puts it under the that's tires cool, of oh, yeah, that's clever brilliant. that's sort of like an old school or he takes like all the guy's way. business cards so that he can impersonate yeah. him <laughs> it's, almost yeah. like a, it's almost like an old-fashioned way of getting to like what modern tech could do also the thing where he's, he's taking photos of people and he's doing reconnaissance yeah. thought that was cool and then secondly almost to foreshadow the end of the movie earlier on there is a moment in the movie where they do just say to him let sleeping dogs lie which essentially is also the other theme of the movie yes yeah yeah i was going to bring that up i wrote that down yeah it's it's like ultimately you you when he says let sleeping dogs lie he himself does not do that and uh it, it you know it's not that he gets Faye Dunaway killed, but there's, there is an alternate timeline, and I know this because it was the original script, 
Oh, okay. Where even even though John Huston's character gets away with it and they get all the land and they get all the money, he does right away with it. That was the original plan. That like that well, so, okay. that would be a bad ending, not, surely. Not that he rides away. Not that he rides okay. away. She she I think it was like she shoots him and she goes to prison, but it's only gonna be a short time because she can blackmail him with the fact that you know, he raped her and fathered, you know, the child. And so she was only going to do a little spell. Um, and that was the original script. And there was a lot of discussion about this, actually. Jack Nicholson sort of wasn't sure which way was best. The original screenwriter obviously disagreed. It was Polanski who insisted that, um, you know, Faye Dunaway's character died, which is hilarious when you consider... Oh, no, I'm just thinking. Plus, 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 the guy who was like diddling the kid, he gets away at the end. Like, Scott's got a thing. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, you know? Everyone's like, uh, well, I don't know, actually. Should, no, don't you want there to be some it. sort of accountability know. or whatever? Like, no, no. Yeah. He gets away and the woman dies. No. But, well, all right. <laughs> So yeah, Yikes. a bit weird, but so yeah. That's really called it the happy end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there, there was an alternate timeline where basically Chad Nicholson's character and Faye Dunaway's character were going to have some sort of relationship that's beyond ridiculous. the movie, okay. but Polanski it sort of intervened and said, and and this was his rationale for it, which it, it makes sense. He said the rest of the movie is so complex in terms of its plot. Let's make the end very Shakespearean and very simple. They die. You know, and 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 I can respect that. Um, I I think the film is it, it just feels amazing. much more like a classic yeah. tragedy in that case. Yeah, right. Totally, totally. Mm. I think it's an amazing film just on its face, in terms that you know it it, it almost transcends noir in a little bit, but it is very much the sort of it, it's the best example of a modern noir movie although we might get into with la confidential maybe some people feel that way for me it's still this it's still chinatown but you know it takes a guy it's it's his perspective the story seems to make sense at start at the start and then it unravels and then it's this nightmare and the guy doesn't know who to trust doesn't know where he can turn to and then essentially it points to this broader tragedy this sad thing this is a movie about loneliness about isolation about fighting forces you can't triumph against and that's what I love about it. And it's just, in, and at the end, after everything you fucking seen, they just encapsulated in one line. Forget it. It's Chinatown. Forget it. It's esports. Forget it. It's politics. Forget it. It's the you. You can't win. And Jake get his character is hauled off into the dark on that Chinatown street with the neon flickering in the you know seventies neon, and Faye Dunaway's dead. And what's your next case? We'll never know. Fuck! It's a gut punch. It's insane. This 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 film is a fucking it's just a masterpiece of storytelling it doesn't need a big performance to sell it in fact if anything the understated natures of the performances of the main actors in the movie really help when the supporting cast turn up like john houston who is fantastic in this film um I just love this movie. I, I, I can't recommend it enough. One of the things I've been really touched by is seeing all the Zoomers leaving, well, you know, all of them, all 20 of you, leaving messages <laughs> on the Maltese Falcons, and I would never have watched this movie without this recommendation. This one will not disappoint. I, I swear to you, I promise you, if you love film on any level, this is one of the greatest movies of all time, and it holds up to this day. I would also say to this point in the series, this is the best film we've done. <laughs> yeah. And also probably the most famous overall. I mean, we we've kind of stayed away from some more of the mainstream ones, but this is the first film we've done that stands out on many people's lists of greatest yeah. movies ever made. Uh, so it's, it, it's been fun to chat about. In 2010, the guardian said the, this was the best film of all time. And then by 2020, it didn't even make that top 20. You fucking cowards. <laughs> That's uh, it's wacky <laughs> how so many how so many movies could be made and greater movies could be made in such a short period of time. 
wild to think, but I, <laughs> but I get it. I, I think I, I understand this film being, um, I, I think it certainly holds a mirror up to a lot of uncomfortable stuff in in modern society. You know how people use that god-awful phrase, it's, it's more relevant now <laughs> than it was then. It's like, no, it's not. It, it, it just, the same things keep happening. I think a lot of people would get upset if you, you know, it, it's very dark. It's a very dark film. There's nothing close to a happy ending in this for anyone. <laughs> like for for literally any of the characters, I mean, Noah Cross about... does okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> okay. So technically, we don't actually know if, if totally what happens to him. Maybe that injured him. Who knows? You know. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just a very tough. It's a very bitter pill to swallow, and I think this is why people have forgotten it. It's not like there's no fun aspects to it, like the Maltese Falcon. There's nothing fun about Chinatown. It just is Chinatown. Forget it. 